Welcome to the Emerging Minds podcast. You're with Dom Kleinig and today I'm speaking with Perth-based psychologist Dr. Matthew Ruggiero about mentalizing and mentalization based therapy. Matthew has worked in private practice for nine years and also lectures at Curtin University. His clinical work is focused on working with children, adolescents and adults when things seem to be persistently going wrong in their relationships with others. He's also a mentalization based therapy supervisor who consults in health and statutory settings. In this episode, Matt and I discuss the concept of mentalizing as a developed skill that we all use and how supporting its development can strengthen the resilience of relationships in contexts which put pressure on parents and children. Welcome, Matt. Thank you for coming and meeting us here. It's been a long day for you, I know. We're here at Emerging Minds and you've come all the way from WA. Maybe you can tell me a little bit just about yourself, um, just to start with, and your, I guess, your professional history a little bit? I'm a psychologist. I did my um, training at Curtin University and um, went on and did a a Master of Counselling Psychology and um, a PhD with that as well. And broadly speaking, most of my work has been developmentally focused. So um, in the organisational work that I've done and private work that I've done, and the lecturing that I do as well, um, my kind of bent or, or slant is related to developmental processes and the implications of those for treatment. And I've brought, I've got you here today under the pretext of talking about um, mentalizing and yes. mentalizing based therapy. Mm. Uh, so I wonder if you can give us a little bit of a definition of firstly, I guess, what mentalizing is and maybe disambiguate that with things like mindfulness and reflection and reflective practice and mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a good question because um, mentalizing often gets used as sort of, sort of catch-all term for those reflective processes, empathy, um, psychological mindedness, affect consciousness, all of those sorts of terms, mindfulness. And actually it has a very specific definition. So mentalizing is a normal human ability to think about intention. So if you think about um, behavior in the world, we'll act and we act with others in the social world. Uh, Actually, our ability to react well together and sort of to engage in teamwork together depends on our capacity to make some sense of why we're doing what we're doing and why other people do what they're doing. And mostly we don't have to think about that. It's something that instinctively comes to us if we've had a a decent enough upbringing um, and a decent enough experience of having the people around us during our upbringing make what's happening in our minds and in their minds fairly clear. So mentalizing is this ordinary sense of trying to think about what's happening in people's minds to try and make sense of their actions. And the reason it turns out to be quite important is because one way of thinking about quite a lot of psychopathology and, um, and certainly personality pathology is as a sort of communication breakdown an inability to flexibly and curiously make sense of what goes on behind behavior when we're together. So I hope that contextualizes it a bit. Um, And the reason I would say that it needs to be distinguished from those other concepts is because unhelpfully probably it kind of captures all of those concepts. All of those concepts are in a way a sort of little bit of what it means to mentalize. So empathy, for example, is other focused. Uh, It's about me trying to tune into you and what's going on for you and tends to be more about how the other person's feeling. Mentalizing captures that but it's also interested in what's going on in my own mind, what's going on in me um, as I'm with you and um, and not just in feeling but in thinking or how our needs might be impacting us or our longings or wishes or desires. So it sort of captures a lot But if you wanted to strip it all down, it's really about trying to think about why we're acting the way we are and what sits behind that. Hmm. 
It sounds like a very fundamental process in, in, in that way. Well, the creators of mentalizing and MVT would say it's a fundamental process and I would tend to agree with them. And maybe one of the reasons why I see it as being fundamental is because it's such a critical developmental capacity. Another way that it gets talked about is in terms of theory of mind, being able to think about what's in someone else's mind, which is something that normally emerges around four or five years old and actually it's really essential in the years leading up to that that we have good experiences of having adults do that sort of wondering and thinking and and labeling of um, the mental states that, that we as children have can i just i guess just thinking a little bit about us uh, here at emerging minds mm. and um i think one of the things that we try to put out into the world is a picture of the whole child and I think some of the things you've talked about of having a caregiver who can say what's going on or give you some um, insight into yourself and into the world around you and having people around you who can do that for you as a child and as you're developing can you just tell us about how maybe mentalizing fits into a picture of a of the whole child and I guess a child's ecology I think that one of the key ways it plays into thinking about the child as a whole, developmentally speaking, is in through the process of marked mirroring, which I can explain fairly quickly. If you think about any of the feelings that you're able to distinguish, you know, if I was to say to you, how do you know when you're angry? And how do you know when you're sad? And how are you able to work out that you're one and not the other? Actually, that's a very difficult question to answer. Um, in any real way, because most of us don't sit there thinking about our feelings explicitly and thinking, what is this feeling? Oh, I guess it's probably anger. It's definitely not sadness. We just sort of know. And we kind of take for granted that we just know. And actually, it's really important that we're able to just know because um, being able to just know means that we can respond quite quickly to the things that are going on around about us. And we can respond in a way that's sort of about what's going on for us. You know, if you're sad, you need from your environment different responses to when you're angry, for example. So the way we learn to distinguish our internal states, and there's way more than just those two, is through this process of marked mirroring. What happens is that babies and young children don't have words, don't have nice um, concepts in mind to be able to distinguish but actually by having adults around who can recognize states, who can respond to them, not in an intellectual way, but in a way that's sort of about what's going on. So when the baby is screaming and desperate and frantic for, for some comfort, a mother or a father who is able to read that, and most parents, the vast majority can very naturally, um, won't just say they're there. They'll respond sort of in a physical embodied way and become the sadness or the distress will be plastered across the parent's face and so we call that mirroring because it's like the parent is holding up a mirror to the child saying look this is what you're feeling this is and I get it I see it and it's not too much for me and I'm coming to your aid in response but the second quality is marking that's important and that is that when the baby is highly distressed that actually the parent isn't equally distressed it's not a perfect mirror the parent isn't thrown to pieces in the way that the baby is feeling all to pieces the, the parent takes the feeling and gives a sort of caricatured response and again this is all totally natural and instinctual and part of how we continue as a species and so the parent responds in a sort of exaggerated way so oh there 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 and, you know, it's very uh, comforting. And this process repeated over and over again reflects good parenting and is the foundational way that the child is then able to take in a sense of this is the experience that I'm having. It has a name. It has parameters that aren't overwhelming. I know that because I'm with someone who's not overtaken by these. And over time, the baby or the child is able to draw on their own sense of what it is that's going on inside. There's a very, a, a very nuanced, fine process that happens over a long period of time, but is basically the early precursor to mentalizing, to being able to distinguish that there are things that are happening inside, 
that they can be very powerful, that they evoke needs, and that we act in response to them. Thank you for that explanation. That's a really good uh, detailed way of putting it. And I found myself as you were explaining it, mirroring your enthusiasm mm. for the for the content of what mm. you're talking about. I was sort of, my eyebrows were raising. It, it happens naturally. You're yeah. drawn. And it felt very natural. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah it mm. did. And, and it's probably worth saying in terms of pathology, because I know that we often work with um, the sort of few for whom um, things fall apart rather than the, those who happily go about doing the job of parenting and child rearing and it all goes well. But the, the reason why knowing about this process is important is for precisely that reason. When it doesn't happen effectively, actually it, throws thing, it can throw things out substantially for a child. Um, when a child's experience is that they're not able to have their states seen accurately, or responded to um, consistently, contingently is what we call it. It creates problems down the line in terms of that child's ability to, first of all, contain their states, sort of down-regulate them when they're too big, and second of all, to be able to read states accurately in other people and then respond to them. So in the worst cases, in the most problematic cases, you have the experience of the personality disorders that start emerging in early adolescence, uh, where actually the experience that um, the person suffering has of the world is that I know exactly what's going to happen in a social interaction. I know exactly what I can expect, and it will play out that way. And that means that there's very little ability to take in new information or to learn from social engagement. Mm. It becomes quite, quite fixed or rigid. Yeah. In the, yeah. yeah. When in fact we need to be able to take in new information. We need to be able to work out, in a way, each time we're interacting with someone new, uh, we need to be able to work out how trustworthy is this person and uh, how much do I need to take in something that they're giving me? How, how much do I need to be able to respond? Um, to what they're giving me hmm. as if that if that process is gone awry then either it results in too much trust for the wrong people and you you can for that sort of thing bring to mind um, people who are quite naive who might be easily taken into awful relationships violent relationships and that sort of thing you can also have the the opposite a kind of profound mistrust and inability to distinguish gentleness in your eyes or relaxed posture and perceive a sense that actually talking to you Dom you look like you're the kind of person who's going to be open to me and who's going to give me something useful if I'm not open to seeing that if the implicit kind of set of beliefs that I bring to this are that you you're going to be mistrustful you're going to hurt me and you're going to misunderstand me that actually destabilizes social relationships in a way that's very hard to to repair. Hmm. So for someone who it might be working with um, a family or with a child and, and there maybe there's this context where they don't have a way of understanding people's intentions as clearly as someone who has had that developmental experience of being held in mind and being seen clearly. What are some of the things that MBT can offer to them to support those families and to engage them? Well, I, th I think the answer to that question actually isn't just about MBT. Increasingly, it's about what we're starting to see in the literature underpins uh, most of the treatments that end up working. MBT isn't the only one that uh, is effective. It just sort of is the most explicitly focused on mentalizing. Um, but the, the things that seem to be important are first and foremost that practitioners treat the people they're seeing as self-determining agents, that they're interested not in insisting that there's a problem to begin with and challenging that there's something to change, but actually trying to see the world through the eyes of the family or the child or the person that they're with. And it's not about paying lip service um, in validating, but it's actually showing that um, if you've come to see the world in this way, there must be some way in which that's a valuable way for you to be seeing things. 
and it's modeling that actually I don't see things that way straight away because I've had a different set of experiences and I need your help to, to put it all together, to be able to imagine exactly how things are for you. So it, it is validating, but it's not about just uh, what often gets thought of as empathy, you know, there, there, um, all that sounds terrible. It's not that kind of empathy. It's about trying to actually build a picture of exactly how this looks. And then it's engaging the patient's agency, i.e. not providing all the answers, as though a therapist somehow has all the answers, but trying to work together to work out how are we going to look at this as a problem, how are we going to look at where you want to get to, and how are we going to navigate that as a partnership. And what becomes important there is that the therapist has a coherent structured way of thinking. So this is where it's important to have a theoretical model or a treatment model that you're confident in being able to, to draw upon to put the pieces together. So for example, in MBT, if we're thinking about mentalizing, we might sit together and I could say, look, there's a way of thinking about what we're talking about that has to do with this thing called mentalizing. And you, know, you can sort of map it out together and see whether that fits the, the person's sense of what goes on for them. And if it does, then you've got a, a structured way of thinking about what the matter is. How are you using that in those contexts and what does it look like in some of the people that you're, that you're seeing, you know, children or parents? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think although I relish the opportunities to do MBT formally with people, more often than not, the work that I'm doing is sort of MBT light where, and I think around the world, actually m more people are engaging in a sort of mentalizing informed treatment approach than actually doing the, the formal thing that the Anna Freud Center has specified in mentalization based treatment, which is a roughly 12 to 18 month process of engaging in an introductory psychoeducation group followed by weekly group and individual therapy. So it's a very um, specified process and um, there's a lot of adaptation going on because of how intense that is. For example, Child Protection Services just simply wouldn't be referring me people if I was to say to them that in every case I needed 18 months of group plus individual therapy every week. Yeah. So it, it becomes this interesting thing of trying to work out what's needed and what's the most efficient way that we might be able to go about doing that without compromising on the fidelity of what I'm trying to do. And really to simplify that, it's exactly what I'm talking about. So I'll initially engage in a period of trying to understand how whomever I'm with sees the difficulty that has brought them to see me. And we engage in something that's quite central in MBT, and that's a period of formulation. And for most treatments have a way of formulating, but it differs a little bit in MBT, in that the goal is not for the therapist to develop a kind of expert conceptualization of, of the problem through whatever theoretical lens they have. The goal of formulation in MBT is to model sitting together and placing the patient's mind in the middle and trying to think about it together and make sense of it together. Mm. And although a therapist might come with a sort of a structured way of thinking about the patient's mind, so you might write a, a paragraph or two about what you think's brought them to see you and how you understand it in mentalizing terms, actually the point of it is not getting it right. In fact, the opposite, the point is to be able to work together to update the way I think about things so that we can both buy into the way we're seeing this. So in a way it's mentalizing together right from the start. It's trying to think about what, what is occurring in the mind of the person to result in their problems. And um, it models the respecting the nature of minds in that minds are opaque, that even the best theoretical models and treatment models only offer hypotheses, general ways of putting things together, 
it is very anxiety provoking to work out how do we sit here and put your parenting or for a child who's experienced horrible things in their past, how do, how do we find a way to talk about that together in a way that brings us together? It's a very fraught process. It's, I don't know about any other therapist, but it's an anxiety provoking process every time for mm. me. Mm. And um, the urge, uh, well, the various urges that I've seen in me and in my supervisees are to get very good at explaining. And that provides a little bit of sort of distance. If I've got the explanation, then it's all worked out. I don't have to be so anxious about it. If they disagree with me, then they've just got it wrong. So you know, the, having an explanation can be a bit like needing to settle my own anxiety about this. Mm. Being interpretive is another way that we can uh, manage our own anxieties. And all of these are, at least at the start of therapy, non-mentalizing in the sense that the therapist is essentially insisting that they have the inside scoop on how to put this person's mind together. And even if they're right, in, in MBT, it would be said that even if you're absolutely right, that actually provides no use to the person who has difficulty putting their own mind together. You know, even if the therapist is totally on, accurate in the hypotheses that they have, if the patient can't do something with those hypotheses, they're meaningless. So um, the, the first thing that I think is useful for me in therapy is trying to come up with a, a shared sense of why we're here, of how we're going to see it as a patterned problem and what we're going to try and work on together. And as part of that, I don't know if I'm getting too detailed here, but as part of that, I want to try and specify not just what happens that goes wrong, but actually what we think sits behind that together. Actually, what sits behind the way these behaviours map out in your relationships? What, how do you end up seeing things that means you respond in that way? Um, or that, you know, at the end of a process means you become very aggressive or that you engage in self-injurious behaviour of, of some sort. Once we've got that mapped out, then it's not the behaviour that we're trying to change in a, with a mentalising fo focus. It's building the person's ability to self mentalize to be able to um, make sense of what's going on for them and for others at the times when historically they lose that ability. So the benefit of that approach with the sorts of people I'm seeing who have experienced complex trauma, for whom trust comes very slowly, vigilance is the meal of the day, that early process is respectful and the goal of it is to try and establish some basis of trust where even if it's only tenuous, there will be times when actually I might be able to say or do something that is going to be useful to you. Then we can work on whatever treatment you're doing. You can work on some skills development or you can engage in some thought monitoring or you can offer interpretations or you can do whatever it is you do in your treatment of choice. But actually then it's going to be meaningful because the person's capacity to take in something new from the social environment is going to be at least minimally switched on. I want to ask you a question that probably takes you out of any realm of expertise, but it relates to us here at Emerging Minds. And I guess thinking of that broader context for people, the social environment that they maybe go back to, what's, what do you think the utility of ideas of, of mentalising and even from MBT are at a public health kind of level, if, if that exists at all? Is there something in, at a policy level that these ideas can be of use to policy makers or people who are trying to improve the life of children and children's mental health at that broader that, um, level? Frankly, I think that um, behaviour is important, but we need to help people to see beyond it, that no child or adolescent or adult wakes up in the morning determined to do bad um, or to do wrong. But actually often behavior gets kind of 
perceived or, or um, labeled in that kind of a way. The point of mentalizing is that behavior has a point. It's driven by something. It's motivated by something that's happening underneath. And it is so much easier just to react to behavior rather than to engage in an effortful process of trying to understand it. Particularly, I'm thinking of, of um, kids who engage in quite problematic behaviors. It's particularly difficult for loud, obnoxious, frightening behaviors to respond by in some way for any adult, including clinicians, including teachers, including parents, including mm people in any sort of regard. It's really difficult sometimes to engage in a thoughtful process of trying to understand the point or the motivation of a behavior. Yeah. And this might be the, um, the sort of attraction of behaviorally focused treatment and intervention and um, um, reinforcement planning and all that sort of thing, which there's no, I have no problem with any of that except that in order for long-term psychological change to occur for children, they need help to develop the capacity to mentalize, to think about what goes on inside them and inside others. And we don't learn that by simply being given star charts or by being educated about how we ought to behave. All of that is good, and so I don't want to be seen to be yeah. sort of splitting here and saying some interventions are bad and some aren't, but actually we need to try and foster the development of this skill in children, and it's something that they require modelled in relation to them and their loudest behaviours hmm. um, in order to, to draw out and, and build that capacity. Hmm. So maybe that's what I would change. Yeah. Let's actually try and make some sense of kids rather than... Yeah. Just um, educating them. Yeah, make sense of them instead of educating yeah. them. Yeah, like well, as well as educating yeah. them. Maybe that's a good place to draw a line under the interview. Thank you so much for Pleasure. for giving us an insight into your, um, your work and your understanding of mentalising. I really appreciated that. Yeah. Thanks. Visit our website at www.emergingminds.com.au to access a range of resources to assist your practice. Brought to you by the National Workforce Centre for Child Mental Health, led by Emerging Minds, and delivered in partnership with the Australian Institute of Family Studies, the Australian National University, the Parenting Research Centre, and the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners. The National Workforce Centre for Child Mental Health is funded by the Australian Government Department of Health under the National Support for Child and Youth Mental Health Programme.